Еще раз всем доброе утро. Once again, good morning, everyone. I am glad that there are people who have managed to make it here. We didn't expect it. We we were expecting the speakers, but we were not expecting to have any audience. So, from the outset, I would like to introduce our panel to you. The speakers are going to be with us. We've got two foreign guests. So, if anyone needs headphones for simultaneous interpretation, do take them. The session we have today is entitled Responsible Contact of Development Institutions. It is sort of a partner session uh, organized by RENIPA on the one hand and uh, VEB.RF as uh, a primary development institution. So I'd like to introduce our speakers. To the right, we have Svetlana Yachevska. Deputy President of Web RF. It is a key person there who is responsible for infrastructure projects, and this is what we're going to focus with Svetlana today. Next, we've got Anton Voronin, who represents Dom RF, which is yet another development institution which is mostly about construction industry building rental housing, and this is what we're going to put emphasis on. Anton is the director, project financing, priority projects, all that. Thank you, Anton, for being with us today. Next, let me introduce our foreign speakers. First, Mathilde Mena, who is deputy director for financial and enterprise affairs of the organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. I myself am the head of the uh, OECD Center here at RENIPA, and we are very lucky to have two colleagues who've come to assist at this session from OECD. For me, Mathilde is a key person because she is responsible for corporate uh, social responsibility within the OECD. Thank you, Mathilde, for being with us today. Next. We've got Mikhail Babenko. I don't know how many sessions we've held with Mikhail. Uh, sessions dedicated to green economy and responsible behavior. Mikhail Babenko is director for Green Economy Strategy and uh, also uh, WWF Russia. Thank you, Mikhail. Yet another foreign guest we have, uh, Bill Thompson, another colleague from the OECD, Bill, is also a key player in the OECD, who is responsible for a friendship between our two countries, uh, for, for, for between Russia and OECD for um, smooth interaction. Uh, Bill is the head of the Eurasia Division of the Global Relations Secretariat of the OECD. Thank you for being with us, Bill. We've got two more speakers who are running somewhat late. Irina Makiva, Deputy Chairman of Web RF, Development of Single Industry Towns. And we also have uh, another representative of Web RF. We do hope that they're going to join us in five to seven minutes. Uh, how are we going to organize our session? We've got six blocks and we're going to follow them. Each and every speaker will have a chance to speak on multiple occasions within these sections and we look forward to interacting actively with the audience. And to that end, we have uh, drafted a questionnaire for you. Ivan, could you put the link on the screen, please? Colleagues. Uh, both on the panel, uh, please react to the questions that are going to be put on the screen. And as for the audience, I would like to ask our distinguished audience to uh, take a vote on the questions that are going to be put on the website, uh, on the screen. And this is how we're going to organize. Give it a try. Uh, try scanning the link or 
probably scanning the QR code. Uh, it is supposed to be working. Uh, Irina Makiva has joined us. Uh, morning, thank you for joining us. Irina Makiva is uh, Deputy President of Weber Rev. Uh, she is also the head of the uh, Foundation for the Development of Single Industry Towns. We, we've introduced uh, all uh, speakers uh, before you joined us. Uh, and uh, Sergei Semensov is running late, but we are going to begin without him. Today we're talking about responsible behavior of uh, development institutions. Uh, I would like to say from the outset why this is important and why we should talk about that. We, we should have started talking about that not today, not yesterday, but a long time ago. Sergei Semensov has joined us. Uh, morning. Uh, good morning. Sergei is uh, head of the Green Economy Division of the Research Institution Weberev. Uh, thank you for being with us, Sergei. So why are we even talking about the responsible behavior of development institutions? First, as we can see, standards are being developed for responsible behavior and uh, separate industries. In the past, Corporate social, social responsibility, responsibility was a sort of a framework, framework concept. concept. It, it was, was somewhat, somewhat vague, and, and it was difficult to apply to a concrete industry. industry. But, but as, as we can see, over the, the recent years, years we, we see some, some separate, separate standards focused on particular in industries in agriculture and textile, and they are different. There are different risks involved in different industries, or have a look at Mining, for instance, which is also supposed to have its own standards and particular standards that are important for interaction with local population and that are not applicable to textile industries. So this kind of specialization for corporate social responsibility, this is a trend which we cannot neglect or overlook. We see that if there is no compliance with these standards, then the industry cannot get the necessary funding, sometimes no funding at all, sometimes no preferential funding. Uh, it is not able to hit the market at the global level. So these standards are important to observe. But this is not just about the specialization of these standards. We also see that there are standards that for the last five years have been developed in a rapid fashion in the sector of finance. In particular, the OECD has come up with standards for um, institutional investors. The financial sector is very important banks and development institutions become sort of a conduit for transferring responsible business behavior to the companies they provide funding to. And this is why today we are mostly going to focus about standards and the sector of finance. Another trend which we are witnessing is a growing number of disputes with regard to financial sector. What am I referring to? The OECD, uh, back in the 1970s, came up with an instrument which helps sort of track and disseminate responsible business behavior standards across the countries. There is uh, a key document, the declaration, and around 40 countries are signatories to it, and there are 40 contact centers. Any citizen, any trade union, commercial or non-commercial organization can turn to this contact center if they think that this or that company is acting irresponsibly. And if you look at the statistics, you'll see that around 10% of all disputes are 
in the financial sector, we've been analyzing the trends, and as we can see, disputes are going to be increasingly numerous in the field of financial sector. Because there is this trend, as I've been telling you, and if companies are acting irresponsibly, then the dispute procedure is invoked. Another thing, I'd like to say that corporate social responsibility is not about green economy or responsible bonds. No, this is sort of a self-regulation which can be applied to any industry, to any economic sector. If there is a responsible behavior project, it's not necessarily about greening the economy. No, this is about introducing internal compliance for decreasing risks and acting responsibly. And last but not least, we are going to talk about development institutions and their role implementing these responsible behavior standards differently. And as I've told you, they often act as conduits. In the world, we've got around 250 national development institutions and around the same number of multilateral or bilateral development institutions. So the total number is around 500. And development institutions in Brazil or India, for instance, are mostly putting emphasis on social risks, whereas developed countries development institutions mostly look into environmental issues. And accordingly, the responsible behavior standards they are disseminating and stimulating by providing the relevant funding, the, they're going to have different focus, as it were. And in conclusion, what are we to expect from the future? In future, we'll see that the standards are going to become increasingly numerous. They're going to be increasingly detailed. Some countries are already introducing these standards on a legislative level. And if you're in breach, you are not going to be able to reach the market of this country, nor are you going to be able to deal with the companies of this country because you are going to be in violation of these standards that are going to be enshrined in law. I think development institutions are institutions that can create positive, healthy trends. They show us that responsible business conduct is something normal, which we, we have to see in each and every company. My introductory remarks have run somewhat long. I'm going to wind up now, and we'll move on to the discussion among the panelists. First, we, we have the first part of our discussion, which is called the Trends for Responsible Business Conduct. And we're going to have a question as part of this section. We are now witnessing that around 72% of international companies in the world have already introduced and implemented responsible business conduct standards. And our first question is going to be as follows. What risks are businesses addressing in the first place through internal compliance? I would like to ask the audience to cast their vote. My first question will probably go to you, Mathilde. Mathilde, what, what do you think? What kind of risks, non-financial risks, are companies addressing first and foremost? Uh, risks related uh, either to uh, uh, labor conditions and fighting against the climate, that's the first option. Second, uh, saving ecosystems, fighting poverty. And the third risk, the most terrible for any employer, that is the risk of uh, a trade union being set up. 
So which of the three? Uh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> my, my instinct would say that, that, that the environmental risk, and this means I speak English, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to speak uh, so uh, I think the, the first risk English. Maybe it's, it's because I'm, I'm coming from Europe. In Europe, definitely the first risk is environmental, but it's, it, it's impossible to answer this question because basically it depends on which sector you are. So I don't think there is an answer to this question. <laughs> and you know, in our, in our standards, uh, in the uh, multinational enterprise guidelines at the OECD and in all the due diligence guidance that we are developing, we insist on one thing is that what companies should do should be risk-based. That means they should evaluate for themselves which is the most important risk and there is no one answer to that. So depending on your sector, depending on uh, the, 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 your size, maybe your ownership, etc., you might have different risks. So I don't think there is really a good answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Спасибо, Матильда. У меня вопрос к Сергею. Thank you, Mateo. I've got a question to Sergei. What, what do you think, uh, Sergei, out of these 72 companies that have already introduced uh, these standards, what risks are they mostly addressing? I think I'm going to agree with Mathilde, uh, mostly environmental risks, but of course it's the whole range of risks. And responsible business conduct is, I think, is kind of a normal path when you do not violate the law, when you are in compliance with all the norms, with the rules of business conduct that are adopted both in the country and in the world. So it is an absolutely normal situation. And the company says in that case that it has introduced responsible business conduct. How exactly it's enshrined in the norms and internal regulations, that is an entirely another matter. But the company is acting within the domestic jurisdiction. The company is involved in the whole economic system, but at the same time it is also part and parcel of the global economy and it cannot stand aside from the global trends we, we've got. And the last person I'd like to ask uh, uh, this question uh, is Svetlana. What, what do you think about this question? I'm afraid I'm going to repeat what has already been mentioned because it's hard to come up with anything new. And the whole world, these risks have already been identified. And you could have probably provided us with more options to choose from. Well, maybe labor conditions could be interpreted widely, like uh, social risks. Now, as for environment, you, you have put it in option one and option two. The, the third option, I think, it was mostly a joke about the trade unions. Well, that depends. Well, in our jurisdiction, we do not feel the last risk that strongly. And I think most companies feel the same, whereas in Europe, the situation is entirely different, of course, no doubt about that. But since we are in Russia today, and it is in Russia that we hold this discussion, I would probably choose option one, labor conditions and the fight against climate change. But actually, preserving ecosystems is also relevant to the first option. It has a link to that. But the fight against poverty, it's all interlinked because it's about raising the quality of life and ensuring the sustainability of the country's economy. And it's linked. All of that is connected, as you can see. Most people have chosen the first option, and that's what our analysis demonstrates as well. 
And as we can see now, companies introduced in their compliance procedures a clause on the fight against climate change. But labor conditions is, of course, very relevant because many risks are connected with labor disputes and companies are trying to address this matter. Antonina, I'm sorry, can I take a, a moment, please? A voice from my, behind my back. I've got an entirely different answer. I represent an environmental association, but I'm going to act as a devil's advocate. Labor conditions, fight against climate change, preserve an ecosystems. It's a response to the question, how? But why? It's a different question. And the companies are doing that so as to decrease the risks and get profits. Climate change is not important because it's a global trend or because there is hype around it. No, companies understand that climate change can lead, for instance, to a change in the water balance, and retailers are not going to be able to buy some products from agricultural producers. Or like in Moscow, when we have no snow this winter at all. Yes, maybe that is also relevant. Companies want to preserve their businesses and to preserve their profits, but to do that, sometimes they've got to invest in some things that look a little bit on the side note, but the long-term goal is to preserve their businesses. We're moving on to the next question. Uh, what provides a greater yield on bonds uh, from the non-financial factors, environmental factors, social factors, managerial ones, or the three of them. As we can see right now, investment is growing with a greater consideration of non-financial risks. And uh, we see that 75 companies 75% uh, of companies are taken into account non-financial risks when they try to achieve greater yield on bonds. And just two or three years ago, it used to be just 20%. So what do you think about this question? We, we've got Alexander Grasnov. I didn't introduce him, Alexander, here in the first row. Uh, because the forum's organizers have decided that they had to put just eight chairs, not 10 chairs, uh, on the podium. I'm sorry, Alexander. Uh, my question goes to you. You are responsible for corporate ratings at one of the leading rating agencies, Standard and Poor's. When you look at companies and at profit margins, what do you think uh, accounting for or which factors provides greater yield on bonds today? Alexander, uh, could you please stand up because we've got cameras shooting. If uh, this question had been asked several years ago, I think the answer would have been managerial risks uh, because these were the risks everyone was concerned with. But right now, it's environmental risks that act as the greatest source of concern to companies, to investors. If uh, companies want to participate in international debt markets, securities markets, and if they've got no goals in reducing CO2 emissions or other environmental purposes and goals, then they're going to find it increasingly difficult to reach the global market. Environmental risks have become the centerpiece, the center of attention of all Russian companies acting internationally. I'm going to stand and you, Alexander, take my seat. Indeed. Until 2016, according to the OECD and uh, Standard & Poor's, uh, it, it was indeed managerial risks that provided the greatest yield. But right now, yes, it has indeed changed. 
My question is to Mikhail. We know that Russia has come up with a concept for the funding of green economy. How reasonable is it in terms of international environment? How important is it going to be to provide an impetus to the development of green bonds and securities? This is a very important document, and it is going to be very beneficial. I also wanted to know whether it was in compliance with international standards. The thing is, this is more of an enlightening document, an educational one. We had worked through many documents from development institutions, from companies, from countries, and we wanted to collect it all together, put it in one place, with our end goal being the reduction of risks. It is still very difficult to understand what green means precisely. Could you cite examples? What would you wish to call green economy? Well, there are things we are not willing to call green economy, like uh, waste incineration. What about bonds on waste incinerators in Russia? Are they green bonds or not? The thing is, we have no precise classification in Russia, and the terms are very vague. So we wanted to provide some guidelines when we came up with this concept. I cannot say that we've made much headway in this regard. There is a will to develop a green market, but so far we have not been able to come up with concrete notions of what green constitutes for Russia. And we, we are not yet willing to subscribe to what the EU or China, for instance, names as green. Everyone is sort of grasping for straws in the dark. What about the EU classification? Do you think it's going to have a bearing upon the Russian market? Yes, it's going to be having a very serious impact because we have very strong links to the European market and the risks that they see in European markets, they're going to take that into account in their dealings with our companies as well. That is why we have to understand very clearly what kind of risks and opportunities we've had. Otherwise, we're going to lose this market. And we'll have low economic growth in some industries as a result of that, which would be a not, not a desirable outcome. So we should study this instrument in detail. I'll have a question to Irina, a quick question to Irina who is the key person responsible for single industry cities in this country. I'm subscribed to her page on Facebook. So, and uh, I, I, I learn everything about this single industry cities from her profile, Facebook profile. So what is your expert, expert perspective? Like, I, I recall uh, the single industry cities being a priority in, in the past of the federal government and one of our uh, projects was kind of migrating to green standards for those industries in those single industry cities uh, and the conversion of new products and services. So your vision to your mind, whether we could switch those single industry cities to green standards and whether their potential in this regard is high. The potential of single industry cities is infinite. What is a single industry city? It's a, a plant city, a works city, and the environmental damage, cumulative damage, is much greater than in other cities. So in this respect, each project and any project that would not pollute the environment is considered as superb by, by us. Second, the single industry cities, and we have a foundation for, for this project. Uh, well, for us, new jobs are not our overarching goal. 
any longer. And by the way, I, 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 I saw Mr. Plahotnikov Alexei Mikhailovich uh, heading one of the uh, single industry cities in the region of Russia. And at the outset, we thought what could be done to reduce unemployment. And we, we strived for the maximum number of new jobs. So, like the. Now we are looking at a different concept. We are looking for projects that would be worthy to develop this or that city. It is a case-by-case, case, customized selection. And now the single industry cities, uh, in our perception, cease to be the most polluted ones, the filthiest ones. No, they have become the drivers. They are now considered and deemed to be enablers and drivers of the economy. This is the new concept, and all together we participate in the clean games. We we remove all the dirt and filth and improve the environment there, together with the core industries and core uh, enterprises of those towns and cities. We clean the streets and uh, we organize and set up magnet spaces in each of the uh, towns and cities to attract youths so that they can socialize. So our concept today is that single industry cities are leaders worthy and deserving of the main and the best projects, green ones and others. And probably new categories of projects would follow. We are yet to define them. I, I like looking at Irina's face and countenance when she is talking about single industry cities. And uh, I, I have the same countenance when I speak about my child or my horse. You know, we have 320 to one uh, single and uh, unit enterprise cities, and we are one big family as we consider ourselves to be. And now I'm moving to the second block. The second unit of issues about the responsible business conduct and development institutions. And here I'd like to bring up a question on what a responsible development institution should do uh, in the first place be part of the UN Global Compact or be part of the Equator Club. Uh, so being member of the Global Compact of the United Nations, not funding projects with insufficient funds and number three, introduce standards, internal compliance, non-financial risks compliance on their own and uh, promote responsible business conduct, conduct, which is uh, the option number three. Now there are around three or five hundred uh, development institutions worldwide and uh, Web.rf accounts for around 5% of Russian GDP. If we look at two development institutions of South Korea, they account for 34% of the GDP of South Korea. If we look at the Chinese development institutions, they're responsible for 19% of the PRC's GDP. And the Italian Development Bank is responsible for 21% of Italy's GDP. So the development institutions are major stakeholders, and their role is not to be downplayed. They are the trendsetters, and they have the three main functions. They provide funding, they extend funding, they create and set up business models and they educate and teach. And third, with the help of those customized business models, they set new trends in the global economy and national economies. So my question would go first of all to Bill, most importantly to Bill. Can you tell us, Bill, whether what should the first thing that the development institutions should do? What should their overarching role be? In this context, I believe the option number three would be most appropriate. 
and relevant. Before I moved to and joined OECD 17 years ago, I used to be a professor of political economy in the London University, in the University of London. And a clear lesson that I have learned is that the rules of the game in any economy are defined by major stakeholders. So the potential roles of the development institutions in each and every economy in defining the principles, the standards, the approaches that will gradually be normalized with or without the help of legislators, lawmakers, is important. And uh, infrastructure-wise, in the domain of infrastructure, it is of special relevance, as we see it. Uh, well, definitely, uh, development institutions also tackle other matters, but uh, infrastructure. But, you know, we have been dealing with G20 uh, task forces, and uh, we have come up with the high-quality infrastructure standards uh, document comprising the responsible business conduct is, and is actually much broader. Uh, an instrument including social and environmental sustainability and the infrastructure quality. It is hard to overstate the importance of this matter because, as, as we know, so the bulk of the infrastructure that we will be using in the second half of the 21st century is yet to be built. So in the th 30 years to come, we are to erect a huge number of installations, a great deal of infrastructure. So if we do it in the wrong way, the after effects will be felt, felt for quite a long time. Anyway, the development institutions set very high standards at very high levels to be a guidance, to provide guidance for the national leaders and elites and national governments. We know we should be kind of proactive and we should work at the operational level and Mathilde's colleagues in that directorate now started dealing with this stage. They are going several steps down, several levels down, to be more practical. Thank you, Bill. I have a question to Sergei. WebRF is a member of the UN Global Compact. So what should the web.if do so that uh, Russian projects de deploy and implement responsible business conduct standards. Is there is there a list of kind of industries or projects that should not be targets for the web.rf funding? With respect to other projects, they should definitely be in compliance with the responsible business conduct rules. Thank you. I will not, it will be a wrong thing for me to say what web.rf ought to do or should do. Just I can speak from a perspective of a person who deals with green economy as a professional. You know, and development institution is a toolkit to implement governmental priorities and the main stakeholder decides where to put up money in. And uh, for this sake, we have the federal law and state-owned corporations, and we have a memorandum in place. And Web.if has been doing a lot to implement national projects. They 80% overlap with the SDGs by the UN. So they have left with the SDGs, UN SDGs by 80%. And now we have 
chosen our main vector for the future future development and uh, that is in compliance with the global compact or commitments of ours and uh, the development institution a development institution should work to see active economic headway and social headway whether all that will be reflected in our internal documents is now uh, subject to discussion now we are drafting the responsible business conduct concept for the BRICS development institutions as we hold the presidency this year and uh, looking back I must say that we talked a lot about the green funding and the current standards in place. But a couple of months ago, OECD held a green financing forum where Nathan Fabian, Nathan Fabian head of the own organization principles for responsible investing, said that each of the countries had their own economic context and their structure of industry and the rules and principles set up by the EU cannot be fully copied by other nations outside the EU. So definitely the national systems are relevant and they should be in place and we should, in place and we should do something for the BRICS development institutions that are at a different stage of economic development. These are emerging economies these are economies that are that have different things at heart. So this is what we'll look at while uh, designing standards of responsible conduct. My question goes to Mathilde. Mathilde, we see that there are lots of international standards for responsible business conduct, and they are designed and drafted by the World Bank and National Financial Corporation, the Equator rules and Pariah rules and um, other things that were mentioned. OECD now is uh, drafting the responsible business conduct standards for project finance that will take into account the development institution's peculiarities and we will see new standards in, in future emerging. So what is the key difference? Uh, what dis describes the OECD's approach in terms of responsible business conduct versus other international institutions? What distinguishes you from other international institutions? Uh, I'd rather say what, what really what is important for our standards and what characterize our standards. It's first their scope, they are very broad. They cover issues related to employment, labor relations, anti-corruption, of course environmental issues, competition issues, anti-corruption issues, taxes, matters, etc. So they are very broad in scope. Um, another characteristic that, that sometimes makes a difference, but is that I repeat myself, they should be risk-based. So the idea is not a compliance approach, but a risk-based approach, which is quite important because first, I mean, we, we ask companies or financial institu institutions when they look at how they could have negative impact and how they could address and mitigate these impacts to look at the risks for the stakeholders you know, for the communities in which they, they will have negative impacts or the environment, etc. So it should be, it's not a compliance approach, it's a risk-based approach. Um, another very important point is that we, so we, we insist on, on due diligence. So the idea is to do proper due diligence and be transparent about how you do proper due diligence. Uh, so. We are not the only one having this approach, of course, so it's more like the main characteristics that I want to highlight. And in terms of, uh, yes, I think for, for the development finance institutions, because we are talking about that, it's quite uh, important to insist on that uh, because you should look at the risks for the people, for the communities, and not at the risk for 
the financial institutions or the companies. So that's different between an ESG approach and an RBC approach. Yes. Да, спасибо. Это действительно важный момент, что стандарты ОСР, они... Yes, indeed. OECD standards are related with the human rights, and not only that, and uh, environmental standards and labor relations, but also they look at tax compliance and competition matters and science and technology matters and uh, consumer rights protection. So the scope of yours is much broader then uh, we then we moved here in this country when speaking about the environmental standards solely so my next question is about the fact that there is a plethora of standards and lots of international organizations that set up standards but anyway here we have a representative of an international institution uh, who also work in the Responsible business conduct, Mikhail Babenko from WWF. What is the recommendation of the WWF to financial institutions when they, before they start funding major projects in agriculture? So um, establish a, an eco management system, which is option number one. Number two, assess the impact uh, on the local community of a project on the local community. So what should be done by the financial institution before, a financial institution before they want to put up money into that project? The third option is, is to, would be to make a donation in favor of the WWF. I wanted to say that the third option is the best one, donate money to WWF. Uh, kidding. Okay. My question goes to you, Sergei. What should a development institution uh, be peculiar and particular about before giving money to an agricultural project? A, well, a development institution should always be quite clear about the financial and non-financial parameters of the project. They should be assessed carefully. I know what you want to hear from me. It's sustainability to climate change. Well, this is not the main thing, but it is also something that should be borne in mind. And all the changes in the agriculture we must take them into account to assess the feasibility, economic feasibility of a project. But now, for us, it's kind of a theoretical matter, in a certain extent. Mikhail, what should a development institution do? The, the main, the best question here, the most suitable, is number two of the options in the screen. And in environmental impact assessment and should be carried out by uh, development institutions before enrolling and signing up to that and uh, the assessment of the impact on the local community so first of all my disclaimer we're a russian non-for-profit entity which is part of the network with the overall umbrella brand of wwf so this, is, this has been the disclaimer. And number two, we have our own visions and positions on some matters. But if we speak about the development institutions, uh, you know, myself being a focal point for the EBRD and the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank and BRICS Bank, I must say that there are no definite and definitive requirements to the development institutions. It is a flexible process, uh, an agile thing, and for us what is important uh, is to make sure that the development institutions should listen to local communities' needs and desires, and they should listen to the people, and that take, take that all into account, not only 
in terms of non-financial reporting and in this domain I'd like to praise the Vnyashikonom Bank Corporation but in other, pro in, in other domains as well and the openness here matters a lot. We work with the development institutions while pre they prepare social and economic policies and we believe ourselves to be experts because we work in social and environmental domains which is the expertise that the development institutions may lack and our knowledge may come in handy for them to shape their policies correctly. Number two, my point number two, we participate in the drafting of industrial strategies, sectoral strategies. For us it's important to present an overall picture of the future of energy, agriculture, water resources and other sectors, other areas. This is what we try to ingrain into the development institutions strategies. We have several major achievements, real achievements, like in terms of how we assess the projects implementation like the Asian Developer Infrastructure Investment Bank took our recommendation, our guideline on board to to assess the social impact and environmental impact of projects which is a costly instrument but so much uh, important and uh, another thing that we have mentioned today is um, kind of we should not only see what development institutions finance but also we should look at what they don't finance and in the blacklist uh, the um, Europeans put the coal gener coal fire generation and coal sector which has been an another achievement another victory and triumph for the overall environmental community so what is now what now becomes a rule or a principle for the development institutions in 10 to 15 years will become regular and normal in the private sector and private banking system so kind of full openness and engagement with the, the stakeholders and appealing against some of the projects and several banks uh, development banks do that uh, is um, an important uh, thing to tackle we have several projects in the North Caucasus in the Caucasus and the Balkan region on hydro uh, power generation that face the uh, opposition from the local community because there have been no uh, environmental impact assessment and the Brazils um, we you know that in Brazil they refused to fund uh, kind of uh, hydrocarbons fired thermal power plant plants construction. Will that have a reflection on Brazil's energy market? Yes, it will, because it means that Brazil's uh, development bank will not fund thermal power plants, but will fund and finance and put up money in. Uh, renewables and alternative energy sources and that will create more jobs in that domain in that area and new capacity generating capacity brand new generating capacity will be established it is a game changer and it will be a message to the stock markets kind of guys we are quitting this market and definitely the the investors would look at the development institutions moves Closely, our next unit will have a, a bearing on the construction and real estate development. Kind of 30% of development institutions uh, money in CIS was put up in construction and real estate development. So, it is, in terms of quality control, it is also one of the well weathers and one of the major risks in construction is the environmental impact co2 emissions and like for example to produce cement a lot of energy is needed so it's energy an energy intensive industry lots of co2 emissions follow and the buildings themselves emit uh, greenhouse gases 
Apart from the environmental risks, what other non-financial risks um, are important for uh, this sector? The breach of rules of the local communities, death in the workplace, and third is corruption. We have uh, an, an Anton Varonin from Dom.if, a, a structure that uh, specializes in construction. So which of the risks is uh, kind of most important? Thank you, colleagues. It's kind of a provocative question. And our bank, while deciding whether to make up our mind, invest money or not, does a comprehensive assessment. We'll look at the financial sustainability first, but later, at later stages, we we'll try to assess whether a project has non-financial risks, like the cancellation of construction permits, because it was, it had not been issued as per the proper legal procedures, or possible risks of delay in construction, because. For example, migrants may be hired on uh, illegal terms and other things is what we assess and we try to come up with means and ways to minimize all those risks for a project if it is possible. Uh, so I would not single out uh, one of the three because all of, I, of, them, of them are important. ILO in 2017 assessed different industries in terms of peril and hazard and it figured out that construction came second in that black list. Lots of deaths occur in the workplace and during construction process. So in order to reduce mortality during construct construction um, operation is one of the most important questions to bring up. So it's number two in the black list of most hazardous industries for health and life of employees. So another question related to construction now, project finance is gathering steam uh, when the quality of construction is not the responsibility of a uh, de developer, him or herself, but rather when banks become a supervisory body looking at quality assurance. So the question whether the bank should control the quality cons of construction in housing has three options. Yes, it allows to reduce risks. No, it's the goal of uh, it's the goal of the developers. No, the main thing is to earn. So what do you think? I would I would subdivide it into two main parts. The first one would be about non-financial risks and uh, to what extent a a building or an edifice is safe, is accident resilient, etc. In this respect, banks would rely on upon their expert opinions. All the buildings that are constructed have to go through this compliance procedure, have to be assessed by experts. But the thing is, quality is also about the very quality of the building, and this is how the construction companies are competing. This is not just about how well the living space is planned or how good the materials used are, but this is also about the environment, the infrastructure, and the greater the quality, the easier it is to attract investment on good terms. I have to tell you that Dom RF worked together with Strelka Design Bureau to develop standards of city environment. We finished this process back in 2013, and some amendments have already been introduced into the compendium of design norms. In December, Moscow 
hosted a big conference that brought together around 300 construction companies from all across the country. This conference looked at a great number of projects, not just in Moscow, but in regions as well, that are currently being constructed in compliance with the standards that I've just referred to. Thank you. I've got a question to Svetlana. What do you think, Svetlana? Do you think financial institutions should not just control and supervise, but maybe bear some part of responsibility for the quality of a construction site they are funding? I think it is sort of a bizarre question for uh, Verb. I'm going to express my personal opinion, and then I'm going to comment on a number of things that have been put forward before. Now, as for development institutions, I can tell you that their functions and responsibilities are far wider than those of an ordinary bank or an ordinary financial institution. So development institutions have to be supervising the whole cycle. Now, as for a classical bank, it is very seldom, it's very rare that a bank, classical one, accompanies the whole construction process because people are not joking when they choose the third option that the most important thing is to earn money. It's real life, but well, it's a pain too. And no one says that it's up to the construction company to control these risks, even though it is, because it is the business of the key investor that is at stake. For me, the results of the vote are very puzzling. Now getting back to a number of things that we listened to before, I can say that Antonina has cited some very interesting statistics as for the share of development institutions into the GDP growth. I think the low share we see in Russia is mainly due to the fact that as compared to our economy, the, the, the number of development institutions is big as well. We, we've got 5% at VEB, and we've got many development institutions, and not just VEB, and w w we have not t taken into account everything, every institution, and we are one of the leaders in terms of number, and w w by the way, that is a characteristic of developing countries, not developed countries. Well, the thing is, we have not taken statistics from everyone. We haven't received it from everyone. Maybe the statistics is not representative enough. But anyway, in Russia, the share is very significant. Now, as for the share of development institutions in developing and also in implementing standards, whether development institutions have to uh, introduce these standards in practice, uh, yes, the question uh, the, the answer to this question is yes, because banks are not going to do that. Of course, international organizations and associations are doing that, but they cannot do that in the same manner and at the same level as development institutions. And that is why we see the prominent role VEB is playing in implementing these standards, both in its uh, procedures and what it's doing if you have a look at the principles that we are trying to the principles we're trying to implement in the legislation we see these are rules that were endorsed by the G20 they are related to the quality of infrastructure investment and they correspond to um, responsible business behavior and it's up to the development institutions to implement these principles. And this is one of the goals that we have set for ourselves this year. We have come up with a methodology which will inculcate in the market the will to and the wish and desire to take into account all of these issues. First, of course, these are going to be 
purely recommendations. Business and enterprises have to realize themselves that they cannot live without that, that it's impossible. But then it's going to be an imperative rule. And that is very important because otherwise this is going to end up creating for us a worse infrastructure that we could have ended up with if we were more insistent upon the implementation of these uh, standards and principles. The key role of Web RF is not just to study these principles methodologically, but also to implement them, to disseminate them in uh, obligatory standards, as well as the rules for selecting and for expert assessment of projects. Alexander, I've got a question to you. Your agency looks at non-financial risks companies have, and non-financial institutions in particular. So do you think the financial institutions have to supervise the, the quality either before the funding is provided or in the process or afterwards? As colleagues have pointed out, I think the answer is mostly yes. But the thing is, when a bank or any state institution give an assessment to a project, they usually assess the solvency, mostly, and the financial standing. But in terms of responsible conduct, there are no yet clear-cut standards, and each and every bank is left at their own discretion to do the judgment. And they also need to understand how these projects relate to similar projects and how they compare. It's not just about whether you're going to get back your money or not. It's not as simple as that. You have to understand, too, whether this project is better than the other one. And the role of the development institutions is to choose the project that deserves more than the others to get the funding because it's more responsible and so on and so forth. Yes, development institutions have to supervise. They, they have to, to, to make sure to do that. I think audience uh, is mostly from construction companies because no one wants construction companies to supervise the quality, or maybe no one uh, believes in their responsibility. Mathilde, I've got a question to you. What is the OECD doing, or what does it plan to do in terms of introducing the responsible business standards in project financing? on finance in general. That means that in the last three years we have been working on different specific guidance for responsible business conduct in the financial sector. We began with uh, having something on, uh, for institutional investors. That means like providing practical recommendation based on real practice on how you could embed responsible business conduct in the activities of the institutional investors. And then we developed specific guidance for specific type of operations, so we last year we last year yeah we we develop uh, guidance for corporate lending and underwriting operations, and now we are working on project finance, and we are doing so both for the private sector and banks and uh, financial operators, but also for the public sector ones like uh, development finance institutions. So that's that's a whole project that that uh, is currently. Uh, developing and we hope to work with uh, the development finance stations of OECD and non-OECD countries, very importantly, like uh, Russian <laughs> one, the Chinese one, the Brazilian ones, etc. So we are in the process of developing this, this guidance for project finance, yes. I would like to add that Russia is indeed a part of this project and it's a great thing that we are not just going to wait for new standards to arrive but that we're going to take an active part in their development. So I would like to thank Mathilde for uh, Russia being a part of this project. I would also like to say that since we're talking about construction, we have to understand that this is mostly about construction in cities and towns. And if we analyze development institutions and the world, if we look at 
with whom they're working, how they're working, what their priorities are. It's going to be hard to find a city where city development is not a priority, where city environment quality is not a priority. Irina is probably going to correct me, but as far as I understand, around 10% of Russian population live in single industry towns. Single industry towns account for one fourth of Russia's towns and cities, and we know that a special fund has been set up for single industry towns. It provides funding at the request of entrepreneurs to help provide funding. In 2000, uh, over the recent years, uh, a lot of funding has been provided. When such applications and bids are recessed, I would like to ask whether you take into account non-financial risks as well. And if uh, you have none, what do you think, what should it be focused on? Social, environmental, export orientation, or social, or anti-corruption? It is a difficult question. In any city, in any town, when a preferential loan is uh, given, most people think that it is going to be a relative of the mayor who is going to get the loan. It used to be the case, and for a long time, this is going to be what people think very often. We have come up uh, with a special loan at 0% annually, and we come to cities and we tell them that they can get a loan for 15 years at 0%. First, there is this troubled silence in the audience, because no one believes that this is possible to get a loan for 15 years at 0%. You've said that more than $2 billion has been provided in lending, and we have two options. Either we construct infrastructure or we provide subsidies. But the thing is, infrastructure improvement is the foremost thing to address, and I agree with Bill. For the next three, 30 years, or maybe 50 years, this is going to be foremost question, and cities in particular. If we talk about the infrastructure uh, in the old sense of the world, you, you, you look at the water supply network, heating system, you see that the wear and tear stands at 80, 70 percent, and no one has addressed this issue for many decades. And the problems are piling up, and they have to be addressed. And for us, it is a priority in 100 biggest cities. And this is task number one, which we have in those cities, to address the wear and tear of the infrastructure. Apart from the infrastructure, we are contemplating the provision of loans for a long time and at a cheap price. I'm going to cite the example of a single industry town, Katovsk, of Katovsk. When we came there for the first time, Alexei Mikhailovich, he, he told us, look, Irina, this uh, enterprise is not working right now, but it can turn into a platform for the development of business in future. Back then, I had no response to that at all, because the situation in Russia and in these single industry towns was so dire that we're fighting against mass firing, mass sacking. Alexei Mikhailovich, how many residents do you have right now? What has happened to that enterprise past which we, 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 we're driving? What, what is happening right now? We've got nine residents right now, and three more are in the pipeline. Three more companies are going to join as residents. Now, as for that enterprise, out of nine residents, four are headquartered there. And if we get two more joining in, this enterprise is going to be resuscitated fully. Well, it has already recovered. Uh, it used to be bankrupt, but right now 
we are revivifying it. We're trying to give a new lease of life to the enterprise and to the city, thanks to the preferences, to special terms that have been provided to us. But Irina, it is better to tell how we built a road and how we signed on December the 30th the agreement on the loan. You can write a book about that. We have to use this instrument, this fund. This is a very strict, very well-disciplined institution, but if you do everything the way they ask, this is going to be a huge benefit, and this help develop single industry towns. Alexei Mikhailovich, well, we didn't plan for that. No, 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 it's not scripted, of course. It's all impromptu, it's all improvised. Personally, for seven years, at the federal level, I've been trying to secure the implementation and the adoption of responsible business conduct standards to show to the businesses what kind of instruments you can use to reduce risks in non-financial sphere. And I can tell you that it is very hard to secure any headway because the government with, whose support we used to enjoy has all now migrated to web.rf, and at the federal level there is no clear understanding, no correct understanding of what this behavior conduct standards are. They're trying to tell me you have to take off your rose-tinted spectacles. No, I'm telling them this is a real way, real path towards improving our businesses. So as a mayor, as an official, what do you think? Do you think these standards are something abstract, like that little monster with ice cream you used to see on the screen? Or maybe this is something real you are willing to support at the level of your single industry town. Are you willing to show the businesses how to use these things? Uh, we're willing to engage in a pilot project. Oh, yes. Got that? I'm going to to talk to you afterwards. We are already implementing these standards, and in particular thanks to the fund. The thing is, we've got a powder plant, and we've got many industrial enterprises, and we've managed to improve our environmental situation thanks to us introducing these standards. And I can tell you, it takes a lot of effort because socialism has somewhat, um, you know, loosened up everyone. But we, we want to ensure and observe strict environmental standards so that the water is uh, clean, air is clean, so that we still have forests. We are willing to be a pilot project for that. Did I say that correctly, Irina? Irina, do you remember we discussed it when you had a big scale session on single industry towns and we, we needed some uh, pilot towns? Well, Antonina, as they say, a rabbit has 100 songs and all of them about carrots. And I always speak about single industry towns myself. They have long been forgotten, abandoned, neglected, even when they accounted for 60, 70 percent of the GDP. And no one spoke about that when there was a terrible pollution and everyone kept mum about that. But right now, when single industry towns are reviving, I cannot keep mum about that. I cannot say nothing. Our fund was set up at the instruction of the president, because this is a topic touching upon many people in our country. And single industry towns have done a lot. And it was here in Ranipa, I think. Many people graduated from Ranipa 
before they went on to become mayors and heads of these single industry towns. And they are no longer afraid of introducing new things, of uh, trying something new. And they do that courageously because those who do not take risks will never become champions. Single industry towns are fed up with uh, this uh, viscosity, with this passivity, and they decided to make a leap, to take a big, to, to, to make a breakthrough. So everything new, everything bright in Russia, we're trying to use all of that, to implement all of that at the level of single industry towns. So together with Google, we launched a project which is uh, called Go on Foot Through the City. We're going to present it at Abu Dhabi in a month. Many uh, people, uh, they, they simply walked through their cities and uh, towns. They mapped the cities, sharing enterprises and uh, tourist attractions using our tourists and uh, foreign tourists. And there are many interesting things to see there. So do come. Another thing, I think the towns that have been pioneering this are also acting as sort of mentors to other cities that would like to do the same, but so far are somewhat lagging behind or stalling. And these towns have fostered very close ties. They're not just cousins, as it were, if I were to use a metaphor. They are one single family, and this is one of the most important benefits of the program. I'm sorry, this is going to be the last thing, uh, Antonina. I thought you were only going to give the floor to me once. The most important thing which we discussed today, we, we uh, touched upon green economy, national projects. We mentioned the city economy, the city environment. As I can see, there is one single red thread that is going through our discussion. Everything we do, no matter the field, the sphere we're doing that in, as for the people, for the citizens, that is an important, it's important for people to enjoy that, to appreciate that. We did not have this question. Oh, we, we are not over yet. I'm sorry, I, I was trying to sum it all up. What we're doing in single industry towns is uh, very important, and especially important when uh, people see changes for the better. Antonina, just a short comment, and for the audience, it's very important there is a causal relationship that has been confirmed between uh, long-term uh, profitability and responsible behavior. It has been confirmed and proved that companies that are acting responsibly in the long term are more profitable. Well, not hugely more profitable, but still. You don't have to think that if you invest in a responsible company, you are going to get less money. We, we've got uh, information that shares are becoming more expensive if uh, they're appreciating, as it were. And another question. We believe that there's going to be an infrastructure gap of several uh, dozens of billions by 2040. This is what the World Bank thinks. So what do you think Svetlana prevents and uh, hinders investment in high quality infrastructure? The number of highly qualified workers or other absence thereof, the dependence of high quality investment on state support and public support, and third, high costs of uh, preparing for the project in, in the light of introducing high quality infrastructure investment. The answer is unequivocal. The market feels that the market 
of infrastructure investment is becoming increasingly expensive. But that is a false assumption. And the thing is, the market assumes that good infrastructure projects, in Russia at least, is those projects that are with the lowest costs, and that is, of course, the greatest, the gravest mistake, because for high-quality projects, a lot of research is required, and the more developed the market, the more research. And these risks pop up at different stages of the project. And if you do not take these risks into account at the very at the early stage, there are risks that the project is going to shut down, that is not going to be completed, that something is going to happen because there are environmental violations or because you have not got the consent of local population and uh, that could lead to local authorities shutting your project down. And there is lack of understanding right now. People do not understand that in Russia. This has not yet become a rule. This uh, important preparation that is required for a high quality project. And this is something we're working on at Web RF. This is going to be one of the main avenues we're going to pursue in our work. Yes. The thing is, the right answer is the dependence of high quality investment on public support. Ivan, a quick question. How, how much does technical assistance account for and the cost of the project? Is it 23.5 percent, 1 to 2 percent, 7 percent, Svetlana? The question goes to you as well. How big of a share belongs to technical assistance? Honestly, I do not know the answer to this question. I would say 7%. But even if it were 23.5 percent, this would still take it into account in the costs of the project, and that would be returnable investment. The very question only proves what I said. If you try to take that out of the project, try to, to take technical assistance out of the project. This is as if we are thinking whether we need to do it at all. No, this is an inseparable part of the cost of the project. And you should probably not say how much and what the share is. International research shows that it's 1 to 2 percent, so it's not as big as you would have thought. And we are coming to the end. We've got block six. I have not introduced Svetlana uh, from UNIDO. I think it's uh, a part of the United Nations. That's the United Nations industrial development organization, and it's the Russian branch of this organization. It looks into raising the efficiency of projects and industry and manufacturing. A lot of projects have already been implemented. My question to Svetlana goes as follows. Do you think whether one of the most uh, novel topics for sustainable textile industry, according to UNIDO's standard, would be uh, bringing new old clothes to late incineration plants and works, creation of um, technologies to reduce the dyes, or eco creation of eco industrial parks. In clusters. A very good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. I represent a, the, the UNIDO Center in the Russian Federation. So this question, which is the most novel 
thing for sustainable textile industry is relevant for the Russian industry and other industries as well. And lots of speakers today have spoken about the responsible business conduct, which is quite relevant for single uh, enterprise or single industry towns or small and medium enterprises prospects. And uh, UNIDO looks at small and medium enterprises and how to develop their role. In textile industry, it all starts small and uh, in developed nations, you know, the bulk of the textile industry is represented by SMEs and uh, in each of the answers to the question, well, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't take uh, the first one in earnest. Anyway, each of them, each of the options is relevant and suitable for the textile and light industry. And UNIDO in, its, in all its, of its countries has been promoting environmental rules and norms and standards and uh, with the help of the technology transfer and, and adapting the technology process to the new state-of-the-art environmental norms have been teaching and training entrepreneurs, assisting them. And your question about textile, once your question is about textile industry, you know, I must say that we have some proprietary forms of teaching and training of SMEs, and we have been helping SMEs and entrepreneurs to act in compliance with the norms. And a technology process probably has the compliance procedures embodied into it because the equipment and uh, the substances are uh, applied I would like to move uh, back again. Uh, no, we will not move back. We will not step aside. We are to move forward because we are running out of time. All right, in this case, I must say that there are two correct answers. We are supportive of technology, um, efficient industrial parks, and the reduction of the dyeing substances in manufacturing clothes and uh, textiles and definitely we recommend to use s some peculiar specialist and tailor-made standards. UNIDO has been promoting these standards in the Russian Federation and we have been implementing them in separate sectors of the economy. I'll, re I'll be executed by the organizers Dear speakers, panelists, audience, thank you for this session. I think we have inaugurated the Gaidar Forum. It's going to be adjourned by someone else. I hope it will not be adjournment for good. So see you soon. See you in future. Thank you. And will you please uh, be swift in leaving the audience because we will have to reconfigure the room for a different session coming uh, shortly. Thank you.